Thank you for letting me speak on a subject I, I like, and especially in the form of a course, so I can go in some detail. That's unusual. So uh, let me first uh, introduce you to uh, one of my closest uh, friends. This is the uh, Heisenberg Group. Uh, are there people here who have never heard of it? Yes, one. OK, two, three. Ah. <laughs> Good. Good. So please listen, <laughs> because this part, this way you can understand, I think. So the Heisenberg group, it's the set of matrices of that form. Upper triangular, ones on the diagonal, x, y, z, uh, real entries uh, uh, above the diagonal. So you know how to multiply matrices. So that's a short way of describing a multiplication on R3. So we are living on R3 with a twisted multiplication. Now I want to describe vector fields. And I'll do this again in a concise way by writing matrices and interpreting these matrices as vectors in the tangent space to that group at the origin. So this is capital X. It's this one. You have X equals 1 and zeros every place else. Y, it looks the same, but with a 1 here. And Z as a 1 in the corner. So might view these vectors uh, as sitting at the origin of the group, x, y, z equals 0, and reproduced everywhere by left translation. So I will not write the formulae for, for these vector fields because I don't know them by heart. I don't need this. All I need are the bracket relations uh, between these vectors. There is this one, and that's the only non-trivial one. All other brackets are zero. Whoa! This reminds me of talks that we've heard today. Uh, this morning, uh, Rifor introduced this um, notion which has so many different names that I don't know what to call it. Let's say bracket generating. So this pair of vectors, of vector fields, x and y, this is bracket generating. Since their bracket is z and x, y, z is a basis of this three-dimensional space, tangent space, to that group at the origin. So this is bracket generating. So now I feel at ease. I'm really in the same setting as Ludovic Rifor and as Nicola Garofalo as well. So I can play various games. Uh, let's first play the, the Rifor's game. So travel along R3, along this group, by pushing either in the direction of x or y or any linear combination of both. So this, this means solving the equation uh, p dot, well, let's use this note, well, p dot equals some combination. So u1 x plus uh, u2 y. And this produces trajectories which I see as curves, which at each point of the group are tangent 
to a certain plane field. The plane field, it's the plane generated by x, y, left translated all over. I'll show a picture of that uh, plane field uh, in a few minutes. Now, I call these trajectories horizontal paths, right? Horizontal, you see what I mean? Even if this, when you translate this plane field, it kind of tilts. Let's go. I'll call them horizontal paths anyway. Right. Now comes a, a new guy in the picture. I don't know how uh, Reform managed not to mention it. It's the natural distance associated to this situation. So the distance, sometimes called the sub Riemannian distance or Carnot Caratéodori distance. Or I hate this word, it's too long to, to pronounce, is obtained by considering all these horizontal curves, all, all these tra reform trajectories, and minimizing their lengths. So, so this is the inf of all lengths of gamma. So gamma is some horizontal curve or path joining P to Q. What I'm especially interested in is this metric rather than any, anything else. Why so? Because uh, when I was a baby, uh, I fell in a pot of metric geometry. And since, I never could get uh, rid of it. So, so my, this course will be a course in metric geometry, so concerned with the distance. So how can we have some intuition about this distance? What do balls look like? I have no idea. I don't know what the unit ball looks like, so let me draw a picture for the unit ball. That's it, so center there. So that's an approximate uh, picture, meaning I'm interested in metrics, yes, but this, the precise value of the metric, I don't really care. But this picture would have been as good for me, right? Because they correspond to equivalent metrics. One of them is bounded by some, unif some constant in terms of the other, right? So this is what I call metric geometry. Interested in distance up to some equivalence. Now, assuming this is the shape of the unit ball, I can draw a ball of a much smaller radius. How? So, crucial observation, this Heisenberg group admits automorphisms. This is delta t of x, y, z equals t x, t y, t squared z. Check, that's an automorphism. And you see that at the origin, in the horizontal direction, in the directions of the vector fields x and y, it simply multiplies by t. In fact, when you push the x vector field by this uh, diffeomorphism, what you get is tx. The same for y. But for, for z, then z now is multiplied by t squared, which is to be expressed expected from the formula or from the fact that z is kind of quadratic, it's a bracket of x and y, and delta t as an automorphism, it goes through brackets, even simply as a diffeomorphism. Right, so since in the horizontal direction, vector, the map is multiplication by t, the lengths of horizontal curves 
are multiplied by t. And so distance, that distance, which ignores the vertical direction, is precisely multiplied by t. So distance delta t p delta t of q, this is exactly distance of p q multiplied by t. I have more symmetry. I forgot to mention that this d distance is left invariant by construction. So if I want to figure out the shape of a ball centered at some point of a certain radius, uh, r, first I use a left translation to move the unit ball to that point, and then I apply a dilation of a by a factor of r, and I get the shape. For instance, r small. When r is small, I take that picture, I, in the xy directions, I reduce by factor r, and in the z direction, by fac factor of r square. So the resulting picture is like this. It is squeezed in the vertical direction. Right. Whatever the shape of the unit ball, the key feature is this squeezedness. So well, you might argue, well, this was a rough shape. Here is another rough shape. What do you mean? So think a, mi a minute. So imagine, uh, for a minute only, that here in Marseille, in area, we obey the rules of Heisenberg geometry instead of usual Euclidean geometry. Right? So imagine the theorem here. It's, a, it's the place where we will evolve for a week. It's our unit ball. Let's say one or 200 meters diameter, right? And now I want to know uh, the shape of a ball of uh, the size of a sheet of paper. Give me a sheet of paper, right? So the, the unit ball is a theorem. Now the sheet of paper, I want to find what the shape of a ball of 10, centimeter, 10 centimeters of diameter. So this will not be a cube of a, a sphere of 10, 10 centimeter radius, of course, because of the squeezing phenomena. And squeezing from 200 meters to 20 centimeters, this produces a ball whose shape is a one tenth of a millimeter. So it's very much like uh, a sheet of paper, indeed. Right? So we are, just for a, a minute, we're living in a world where the, the ball of, of that radius, it's that thick. So imagine you want to, to fill in space uh, with such balls. Imagine that this is a, a slice of cheese and you want to fill in your fridge with such a slice of cheese. That's for you. No, no. Imagine the, the quantity, the number of slices of cheese sheets that thick that you can put in a fridge. That's absolutely crazy. So just to say that we are not living in a world obeying Heisenberg geometry. Not at all. So the, the squeezing phenomenon, that, that's something real. That's serious. In fact, a, a smaller ball is really infinitesimalistic in the vertical direction. So, a consequence of this is that you need, you can pack many, many, many uh, such small balls in a, let's say, in a unit ball. How to evaluate how many? Just count volumes. So, if the unit ball has unit volume, if you apply this delta t map, this delta t has a Jacobian, which is constant, equal to t to the fourth. To get to the R ball, you need t equals R. And so you, the ball of radius R has volume R to the fourth. So when you want to fill in the unit volume with such balls, you need one uh, over R to the fourth 
such balls, so which indicates that the dimension, Hausdorff or box or packing dimension of Heisenberg group is equal to four. Right. And of, so we've seen that the anomalous phenomenon really happens uh, vertically. So these vertical lines, they have a Hausdorff dimension two, right? And so what are the sets of Hausdorff dimension one? For example, the curves with finite uh, Hausdorff measure, one dimensional Hausdorff measure, these are exactly horizontal curves and nothing else. So, so only, let's say, the re rectifiable horizontal curves have a finite H1 measure. Right. So that's the world of Heisenberg geometry. Dimensions which are weird, so it looks pretty different from usual Euclidean geometry. And the, the point of this course is uh, to what extent is Heisenberg group and its geometric geometry different from Euclidean? And the, the way, there are so many different ways uh, to express this uh, that I selected just a few of them. So let me just sk skip this. And now list problems in the metric geometry of Heisenberg group. So that's a long list, and it's much shorter than the potential list. There are many other problems, but I decided to skip to those problems which are open already in dimension three, that one can explain and are already difficult in dimension three. So this is the end of the easy part of the course. So now it becomes a very uh, difficult course because I will mention plenty of different mathematics that you don't know, of course. Uh, so it's likely uh, that you get lost. But I, I try not to lose you too fast. In fact, the, the purpose of this list is to make you aware of a few of the various interactions of Subramanian geometry uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, you already, all of you, the diversity of people here precisely show that there are many, many different interactions. And here are a few others that you might have not been uh, aware of, right? But after I list these problems, this is the point of today's talk, then I will focus on one of them and introduce the, the relevant technology that you may find uh, more or less familiar. So let's start with the unfamiliar stuff. If you are you ready? Ready. Okay. So let's start with uh, this um, contact topology. So I promised a picture of the this plane, this plane field. So I, so the plane, the planes that one sees there, this V1, it's the plane generated by X and Y. So there is one such plane at each point, right? And one can alternatively view it point-wise as the kernel of a certain differential one form which in the coordinates I used uh, is dz minus x dy. It's a left invariant form. It's a three-dimensional group, so you need a basis. Uh, well, left invariant one forms, it's a three-dimensional space, so in a basis I can put this one, which is kind of dual to the z-vector field, 
and the two others would be dx and dy. So kernel of dx is easy to visualize. These are planes tangent to a family of parallel planes, and the same for dy. But this is more interesting, and this is what the picture here suggests, provided you look only at the center of the picture. You ignore the boundary. Look at the center. So what does one see there? I draw a, a disk, a horizontal disk. At the origin, my plane field, V1, is tangent to the disk. And then immediately, in any direction where you escape, then you see that plane that tilts. And if you want to see the whole plane field globally on R3, or on Heisenberg group, then you see this plane tilting along lines, but it will become vertical only asymptotically at infinity. It will only make a half turn in this direction, a half turn in this direction, a half turn in this direction. Right? So what is uh, pictured here is different. You see, if you look carefully, you see that the plane field uh, that one, can, one sees there, it does a full turn until one reaches the boundary of the disk. And you must imagine that then one can continue either uh, rotating forever or uh, converging to some limiting direction. This is uh, irrelevant. So what, I'm, what is uh, on the picture here uh, contains in the small the usual contact structure on Heisenberg group, this one. And if we see the whole picture, we see something different, potentially different, another contact structure. So it's a deep theorem that these two plane fields are not the same. There is no global diffeomorphism of R3 that maps one onto the other. So it's a theorem that dates back to 1983. And this theorem started a, a field which is called now contact topology. That's a part of, of topology or of, of differential geometry that is interested in the global uh, features of such uh, contact structures. So that's a, as defined up there, uh, contact structure means plane field generated by vector fields, which are bracket generating. Right. Another, well, two other uh, deep theorems that came up a bit uh, later uh, state that, in fact, the two examples are uh, the only examples of contact structures on R3 up to diffeomorphism. Now, question, uh, can, so that topologists, they live in a world where maps are C1. I don't. I don't. All I know, myself, is metrics, metrics up to equivalence. So I know what a Lipschitz map is. I don't know what a C1 map is. So for people like, like me, uh, which are kind of limited, uh, the, the following question uh, came, comes up. So, so these topologies tell me that no C1 diffeomorphism maps one contact structure to the other. But maybe I could map one to the other by a by Lipschitz map, a map of R3 to R3, of Heisenberg group to Heisenberg group, which is Lipschitz and whose uh, uh, inverse map is Lipschitz as well. So the question has been open for 30 years. And I know nobody that has any idea how to tackle it. It sounds very strange. Um, there's been some effort. I don't know. I, don't, I can't tell you anything non-stupid on that problem. This is really irritating. I 
I don't need to. J merely saying that the map is lip sheets with respect to this sub Riemannian matrix expresses the fact that it maps well horizontal curves for one structure to horizontal curves to the other. Why? Because horizontal curves are characterized by this property. Well, rectifiable horizontal curves are exactly the curves which have finite Hausdorff measure. And this is a by Lipschitz invariant property. Right? Now, <laughs> that's all I can say on that problem. <laughs> so, just an advertisement. Now, um, I'd like to... Uh, so he has a second problem. It has to do not with by Lipschitz uh, homeomorphisms, but by Lipschitz embeddings. So now I consider maps which are from one space from Heisenberg group to another space. These will be Banner spaces, these LP spaces, which are Lipschitz and uh, no, I don't, I don't want that there is an inverse map. So what I mean by Lipschitz, by Lipschitz embedding, I mean that the Lipschitz inequality is satisfied in both directions. So Lipschitz means this inequality, and by Lipschitz embedding means this inequality. Right? So, and the question, kind of natural, I like to, to draw a picture of, a, of that Heisenberg group. So clearly, the pictures I've drawn up to now are very unsatisfactory, are very approximate, and I only draw balls. And if I want to see a global picture, the easiest way is simply to map the space in some vector space. In three dimensions, this would be great, uh, but of course, uh, you're grown up guys, uh, you're used to thinking in vector space in high dimensions. Okay, so we, I accept uh, an embedding in a high dimensional space, and why not in an infinite dimensional space? Why not? And that, that's the, the issue there. Can one draw a picture which would be faithful up to equivalent metri of, of metrics, so by Lipschitz, of that space in some, let's say, infinite dimensional vector space? And the answer is well, in L infinity, the answer is yes. L infinity bounded functions with the soup norm. Because any metric spaces embeds isometrically. In some, in, in its own L infinity. Just take point to the function distance to that point. That's an isometry. But uh, L infinity is really something weird, much weirder than Heisenberg group, since it contains everything. Go ahead. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, exactly. No. Yes. That, that you're, you're, well, that, that's a good way of thinking. You, you're right. One likes to, to lift things to, to, to the unit tangent bundle or to the tangent bundle. You're right. Uh, this would be a good approach to the problem. But this lip, by Lipschitz maps, uh, in, even in the Euclidean metric, they, they don't seem to lift, uh, they don't lift to continuous maps. So the differential exists almost everywhere, but you can't say much more. Right, so, 
So L infinity contains everything. So that's a terrible uh, space. I should not think that I have uh, any in intuition of what's happening there. However, L2, for instance, that's a very well-behaved space, right? The geometry in Hilbert space is exactly our usual Euclidean geometry. So L2 would be great. Unfortunately, this fails. There is no way to embed Heisenberg group in L2. In fact, in any LP between 1 and infinity, excluding 1 and infinity. And the proof is rather uh, easy. So it's based on the idea of differentiability. Uh, what does this mean? So I say that a map, let's say, from Heisenberg group to itself or to, or to some vector space, well, let's do LP, is differentiable. Well, let's assume that it maps the origin, so 0, 0, 0, to, to 0, just for simplicity of notation. It's differentiable at 0. If I simply copy the Euclidean definition, when I compose F with dilations here and with inverse dilations there, so this delta t, these are the maps I defined over there. Delta 1 over t in some vector space, that's a usual homoiety, just multiplying vectors by 1 over t. If this converges to some, as t tends to 0, to something, to some map, which I call the differential. It turns out uh, that with this modified notion of differentiability, so modified because here I use dilations which are not the usual Euclidean dilations, the uh, almost everywhere differentiability theorem I alluded to for Lipschitz maps turn, turns out to work as well. So it is true that Lipschitz maps from Heisenberg group to a vector space are differentiable almost everywhere in this sense. Vector space, well, for finite uh, dimensional range, no problem. For infinite dimensional range, one must be careful. Um, one needs, for example, that Lipschitz, Lipschitz curve be differentiable almost everywhere. And this is not true for all Banach spaces. It doesn't work for L infinity. It does not work for L1, but it works for all other LPs. That's an issue that experts in Banach spaces have understood in the 1960s already. So it's a very classical fact uh, that one can differentiate when the range are this kind of uh, convex Banach spaces. And this uh, solves the day, right? So apply this theorem. So uh, at some point, there is a differential. Up to changing notation, I can assume that this point is, uh, is the origin. Then, if the map F is by Lipschitz, the limiting map is by Lipschitz as well. Because on both sides, I have dilations which exactly multiply distance by a constant, by t, by 1 over t. And this exactly preserves the by Lipschitz inequalities. So the limiting thing here will be, again, by Lipschitz. I forgot to tell that the differentiability theorem tells us that the differential here is a group homomorphism. So that's a, a map of Heisenberg group to LP, which is a group homomorphism, where here we have a, a billion group. But this is non-abelian. So any homomorphism must have a kernel, the commutator subgroup, vertical line, has to be mapped to zero. And this can't be the case if DF 
is by Lipschitz. Contradiction. Right? So that's a, that's a simple enough theorem. This will be the theorem I prove uh, for this lecture. Right? So it simply relies on this existence of differential almost everywhere for Lipschitz maps in suitable ranges. Okay, so we're happy. Uh, no, no. There are people who want to know more. There are people who insist to understand the case P equals one. They, so why? So I put only one sentence, theoretical computer science. So there is a, a very beautiful story how this issue of embedding the Heisenberg group in L1 uh, enters in computer science. So I have no time to tell this uh, beautiful but long story. But if someone wants to hear about it, I, I can explain uh, later, uh, after dinner or so. If you're curious, so you're welcome. And these people from computer science, they already know what the distortion of an embedding of Heisenberg group in L1, what it should be. It's just for, from, well, they have their, their secret, secrets, which I can tell. And now, and the statement, the conjecture is, uh, is stated there. So a map cannot be uh, by Lipschitz. So there must be points, if the map, let's say, has Lipschitz constant one, it's one Lipschitz, then conversely, there must be points which are mapped very close to each other, right? And the factor is written here. It's square root of log r in a ball of radius r, right? So that's a problem for us, metric geometers, or for us, uh, subramanian geometers, right? So here is a, what is known on that problem. So uh, a very long paper by Chiga, uh, Kleiner, and Naur does the job with a, and obtains a bound of the form some power, some positive power of log r. But unfortunately, they are far from the sharp exponent, which is expected to be a half. And now, more recently, uh, if you cheat and replace L1 with LP, P bigger than 1 but less than 2, then uh, Laforgue and Naur obtain a, an estimate which now has the sharp exponent, but unfortunately, it's not for L1, it's for LP. So the two arguments are totally different. Uh, the first one expands on this idea of differentiability. They turn this qualitative statement, existence of a limit, in something quantitative. And the fact that it applies to L1 is remarkable because that naive version doesn't work for L1. L1 is not a space where rectifiable curves, where Lipschitz curves are differentiable. So it has a lot of ideas uh, which I find uh, fascinating. Whereas uh, Laforgue and Naur prove something that looks very familiar to us, some, some kind of Sobolev inequality and turns by their methods uh, fail for p equals 1. So that's a challenge for us as well. I want simply to point out even uh, more uh, recent results. These embedding problems, they, they really lead to different way of thinking. That is, um, in metric in invariants that behave well under Lipschitz embeddings, these, these are di different from, well, it's a class of things that, that we personally I'm not very familiar with. And the, that starts being 
studied and recently uh, Shawnee uh, studied the Markov convexity of Heisenberg group. This is a, a metric property. Uh, in Euclidean space, we have the par parallelogram equality. And in LP, P different from 2, you have a parallelogram inequality where the squares are replaced by piece powers. And this is what Markov convexity has to do. So it's a fact that in Heisenberg group and in his fellows in higher dimensions, they satisfy the same parallelogram inequality that, than L4. That's um, some feature which I find a bit uh, uh, unexpected. So there's something to learn from these people. So that's all I'll say about uh, this by Lipschitz embedding problem. So we see that Heisenberg group is so nasty, so different from Euclidean, and it doesn't want to embed into uh, these uh, spaces. But the failure is rather tiny. It's only up to a log term. So if I agree to distort the metric a bit more than, than logarithmically, perhaps I can provide uh, embeddings that one can really see, and this might be useful. So uh, let's pursue this idea. So this distorting more than logarithmically is by some power function. So I have a terminology for this. Given a metric space, I can always uh, take a power of the distance. If the exponent is less than one, then that's again a, a distance. So I call this the snowflake uh, metric space. Why snowflake? Because uh, you know the snowflake curve is a by Lipschitz embedding of the real line snowflaked to a certain exponent, which is uh, it's half door dimension inverse, so it's log three over log four. Right. So it's, it's funny to to try to snow uh, to to embed snowflakes of the line into Euclidean spaces, so uh, you, you can do, in fact, any exponent in, in some Euclidean space Rn, provided the Hausdorff dimensions fit. So it's clearly, if x has dimension d, x to the 1 over 1 minus epsilon has dimension d over 1 minus epsilon. So if epsilon tends to 1, this tends to infinity, and you can't you need a large dimension in which uh, to embed. But it's an uh, observation by Jean-Pierre Kahn that uh, Euc snowflake Euclidean space can be embedded in other Euclidean space exactly when dimensions, Hausdorff dimensions, allow this. So Hausdorff dimension is the only obstruction for embedded, embedding a snowflake Euclidean space into another Euclidean space. So what about Heisenberg group? So let's snowflake it and see whether it embeds someplace. In fact, it turns out that a much more general uh, theorem holds. Uh, so this is the theorem by Aswad that claims that every doubling metric space as a by Lipschitz, once snowflaked, can be embedded in a by Lipschitz manner in a finite dimensional Euclidean space. So, what's the statement here is more precise because it, it expresses the dependence of constants. There are two constants the Lipschitz constant and the dimension of the ambient space where you embed. And so, as well, as a construction where both the ambient dimension and the Lipschitz constant depend only on the snowflaking uh, exponent, this epsilon, and 
and the dimension of the metric space, provided you use the aswat bouligan uh, definition. So um, this aswat bouligan dimension counts the number of small balls you can pack in a big ball. This should depend only on the ratio. If, if it's a power of the ratio, that exponent, the optimal exponent, you call the Aswad dimension. But Aswad is careful to call this the Bouligan dimension. That's back to, to Bouligan 1928. So, but now people call this the Aswad dimension, unfortunately. And in fact, the, it turns out uh, that the embedding dimension can be made independent of the snowflake exponent, which, is a, which I find uh, remarkable. Uh, this is a recent theorem by Naur and Neyman. So, and this dimension is simply linear in the aswad bouligan dimension, which is kind of optimal. So it's qualitatively optimal, but what does it tell for Heisenberg group? Well, it just tells us that there is some dimension where one can, by Lipschitz, embed any snowflaking of Heisenberg group. Any. And independent of the snowflaking. But what is the optimal dimension? If I want a picture, not quite of Heisenberg group, but a very slightly snowflaked Heisenberg group, I can have it in some dimension. Can I have it in dimension 5? I don't know. I can't have it in dimension 4, just for Hausdorff dimension reasons. Heisenberg group has dimension 4. If I snowflake it a little bit, this increases the dimension. So it cannot be embedded in R4, but possibly in R5. But that's the only thing I can tell. Again, that's a very simple-minded problem on which all, uh, well, all, I, I can, all I know is written on the board. Right. right. So that's all for embeddings. Let's get back to homeomorphisms. And in the same very related spirit, so by, Lich, by, Lich, by Lipschitz embedding a snowflaked metric means I have such inequalities uh, like this. Uh, I hope I'm right. So it means a map which is Holder in both directions, by Holder. Uh, wait with the same exponent on both sides. So it's much stronger than simply having a map which is Holder and whose inverse map is Holder. So don't confuse. Now I'm entering the, the Holder world. Yes. Uh, so up to now, I, I mentioned, I gave uh, global problems. So from now on, this will be local problems. So, from, from, so let, now I turn to this, this much uh, harder, well, uh, it's much wider. The class of maps to play with is much larger. We're playing with Helder maps now and not by Lipschitz maps anymore, even if there were some Helder exponents uh, Around, yeah. So now, so this, the same dilation argument, this well, shape of balls here, uh, says that the this uh, Heisenberg metric and the Euclidean metric they satisfy inequality. Um, so. The, the Heisenberg metric has a square root in it, so, and 
it's larger than the Euclidean metric. Larger, why? Because here I'm minimizing over horizontal curves only, so a subclass of curves, so the inf is larger than the Euclidean inf. And this comes from this dilation invariance. So, so this means that the identity from R3 Euclidean and to R3 with the Heisenberg metric, this is Holder with exponent a half, and the rever reverse map is, uh, is Lipschitz. Right. And now the question that Grumov advertised uh, some 20 years ago is whether one could do better by a change of coordinates. Right. There is one obvious homeomorphism of R3 to Heisenberg group with these properties, Holder, Lipschitz. But maybe that there could exist another homeomorphism which does better with a larger Holder exponent, for instance. So that's Gromov's problem, which I call Holder equivalence problem. So for a sub Riemannian manifold, you wonder for which exponents alpha less than one, you can have a map well, continuous coordinates, homeomorphism from an open set of Euclidean space, and which is Holder continuous. One can or one cannot include uh, the other request that the reverse map be deep sheets or not. But Gromov pre prefers simply Holder in one direction. He even introduces some notation. This will be convenient because I will continue with this problem. So the alpha of M is the optimal, the, the best possible Holder exponent that is the largest one over all such homeomorphisms from Rn. And so we expect at first sight uh, that for Heisenberg group, the best uh, exponent would be a half, right? But we are unable to prove this. But Gromov has results, which I will now uh, quote. So, well, three statements. The first one, the most general, is rather straightforward. That Hausdorff dimension controls uh, Holder maps. So, this inequality simply amounts to say that on one hand we have Rn which has Hausdorff dimension n, a space of Hausdorff dimension q, a Holder map between them. Holder map cannot increase uh, Hausdorff dimension by more than a factor 1 over alpha. Right. So the first statement is simply this remark. It's the covariance, Holder covariance of Hausdorff dimension. Now, for a sub Riemannian mani manifold with Hausdorff dimension is Q, then Gromov gives the bound n minus 1 over Q minus 1, which is an improvement on the previous one. In a special case, the case that we are interested in, sub Riemannian manifolds. And then for a smaller class, contact manifolds in dimension 3, 5, 7, and so on, then the bound is still a bit better. So in dimension 3, these two numbers are equal, but in higher dimensions, this one is really strictly better than this one. But nevertheless, this never reaches the uh, conjectured uh, sharp exponent of one half. We are very far from this uh, definitive, uh, from the conjecture. I did not define uh, contact uh, manifolds in dimensions uh, 
higher than three. So it's convenient to to view this uh, in so definition. So a contact form, so a one form on a manifold of dimension 2m plus 1. The definition immediately implies that the dimension has to be odd. This contact, if uh, one form tau, te, theta, if theta which d theta to dm is not zero. So I chose differential forms instead of vector fields in order to, to formulate the definition. Um, to be bracket generating, I think it's sufficient that theta which d theta is not zero. So in three dimensions, it makes no dif difference, huh? m equals one. In higher dimensions, it's a stronger assumption. Right. So, right, but when we stick to Heisenberg group, so this is m equals one, the bound obtained here is simply two thirds, so it's not sharp. So here is one more uh, open problem, uh, very easy to formulate. And uh, there have not been that many, that much progress uh, in the last 20 years. So, all right, so that's, that's a metric problem, which is really internal to, to geometry, to subramanian geometry. I'd like to present a, a modification of it, which is really motivated by a problem outside Subramanian geometry, not very far uh, from Riemannian geometry. So this will be my, the last in my, in my list of problems. So it has to do with curvature of, uh, of Riemannian manifolds. So, curvature in Riemannian geometry, that's something complicated. Uh, here, we deal with sectional curvature only. Curvature of a surface, I think most of you have an idea what this means. Sectional curvature for a Riemannian metric in higher dimensions mean stick to a certain surfaces inside your manifold. So point, choose a plane, exponentiate, take, consider geodesics uh, through that point, tangent to that plane. This makes a surface. The curvature of that surface, this is what is known as the sectional curvature of that tangent plane. So it's not the worst. Uh, form of curvature you may imagine. So it's still very, rather intuitive. Right. Now, we here deal with metrics uh, where the sectional curvature is negative. So the prototype of this is hyperbolic space, which has constant sectional curvature minus one. By symmetry, the curvature is the same in all, for all points in all planar directions. And so it's the same all over. That's hyperbolic space. Now, so we are dealing here with, with spaces which look like hyperbolic space. Right? Uh, now, uh, now, if curvature is negative, let's say bounded, it can vary in some interval. I can normalize this interval to start from minus one simply by multiplying the metric by a constant. So with this normalization, then the, I call pinching the, the delta, so which is a, a negative number between zero and minus one. 
uh, the interval minus one delta that contains all values of, of sectional curvature. Right. And I'll give in a second examples of spaces which are delta pinch for, for some delta, natural spaces. And now the question I'm concerned here is given such, given a any Riemannian manifold, uh, can I modify the metric in a by Lipschitz manner, so replacing the metric by some equivalent metric, just bounded with respect to the original metric, and improve the pinching? How far can I go? Can I go up to delta equals minus one, that is constant curvature? So that's the the meaning of this invariant delta of m, the least, the optimal, which means here the least, the smallest interval in which you can f force the curvature to be by changing the, the, the metric in a bounded manner. So that's typically, that, that's a problem in non-compact, uh, for non-compact manifolds mainly. Because this problem in the compact case is, has, an, it has an analog which is very well understood, which has a long history and uh, is extremely popular in, uh, in Riemannian geometry. But this negative curvature version, which is typically uh, non-compact, is not that popular. So now examples. So since I have some time, I can say a word about uh, a complex hyperbolic plane. So uh, that's uh, another of my close friends. So if you have some patience, I'll describe it for you. So you see the world uh, hyperbolic and plane. So I expect most of you to know what the hyperbolic plane is. Right, you this, this familiar picture. It's a the disk in a plane, and the planar Euclidean metric is modified in order to blow up near the boundary, and this produces the hyperbolic metric. And now complex. So this means that instead of being in R two, I want to do this in C two. In C2, that's the complex ball, there is a metric which uh, behaves well with respect to all holomorphic automorphisms of the, uh, of the ball. So the, the well, that's the name, the biholomorphism group of the ball in C2. So it's a classical uh, simple Lie group. Uh, there is a notation for it. So it's PU to 1. And um, it, it is transitive on, on the ball. It can be expressed by matrices looking like uh, homographies, yeah? by kind of rational transformations, not only transitive on, on points, but even if you, the stabilizer of a point, for instance, the center of the ball, the stabilizer is simply PU of 2, U2, unitary, unitary group, is transitive on unit vectors. So it's very transitive, and this makes that that space admits a unique up to constant factor a unique uh, metric, Riemannian metric, which is invariant under this PU21. So how can one, just from this fact, figure out what this metric is? Well, we need to know more. So inside that PU21, there is a subgroup, S, which is simply transitive, that is which maps every point to every, uh, excuse me, key, which maps the origin 
to every other point in a unique way. Right? And uh, that group is a solvable group. It's a semi-direct product, R times, uh, where is the symbol? Here, times Heisenberg group. So, the analysis on the Heisenberg group, this was started by complex analysts in the 1950s and 60s. And why? Because they saw the Heisenberg group in the geometry of the ball. It's there. Now, let me draw uh, the orbits of each of these two subgroups in, uh, in the ball. So, I have to fix a point on the boundary. And now the orbits of the Heisenberg groups, they look like this. And the orbits of the R factor, they look like this. Now, what are these, uh, these uh, red hypersurfaces? Because you know, this ball, it's, a, it's in C2, so we're in dimension 4. So uh, S, simply transitive, has dimension 4, so 3 plus 1. Okay. So these uh, hypersurfaces, these red hypersurfaces, are the orthogonal trajectories of a family of geodesics emanating from that point. And so I should, uh, I think I have a... Yeah, I have a picture here, right? And they're known as horospheres. And different orbits are equidistant. Whereas uh, the R factor acts by translation along one of these geodesics. So in, since this is R times R3, I can use coordinates, T, uh, X, Y, Z, and um, I can write the Riemannian metric on S in these coordinates. It's a left invariant metric on S, and here is how it looks like. dt squared plus delta t, a transport by dilations, some left invariant Riemannian metric on the Heisenberg group, which is dx squared plus dy squared plus theta squared. Right. So now, um, if I... So dt squared alone exactly means that these hypersurfaces are equidistant. And now, the delta t comes because in this semi-direct product, this means that R acts on Heisenberg by automorphisms, and that's exactly the dilations delta t. Let me expand this. So horizontally, the, the x coordinate is multiplied by t. So this gives, uh, excuse me, e to the t, for it to be really a one parameter subgroup. And this gives e to the 2t dx squared plus e to the 2t dy squared plus e to the 4t theta squared. On so what I yes that's the induced the, that's the induced metric by on along some orbit. Let's say I take the image of, a, of, of the center of the ball by this gives a map from S to the ball, and I pull back the metric. And here is the, the formula. So what I see from this formula, because I have been born as a Riemannian geometer, so I see this special expression that tells me that when t varies x, y, z constant, what I get are geodesics. And I see that along these geodesics, 
the speed at which two neighboring geodesics expand, the speed is exponential, except that the exponent is, uh, is one in certain directions and two in other directions. And now the speed at which geodesics uh, escape from each other, this is uh, controlled by sectional curvature. So this indicates that there are planes in the t and x direction, for instance, where the sectional curvature is minus one, and here planes in the t and z direction, where the sectional curvature is minus four. And in between, sectional curvature is in between. Right? So in this way, I see that along, along these geodesics, I see that the, uh, on plane containing these such geodesics, the curvature is really minus one fourth pitch between minus one and minus one fourth. Yeah, excuse me, I made a mistake uh, in my normalization. Uh, yes? So, uh, when I say the TX plane, I mean that I'm some, at some point here, and I move infinitesimally in the direction of T, or in the direction of X, and this forms a, a plane, a tangent plane, right? So, up to a mistake in normalization, because this metric has curvature between minus four and minus one. Excuse me. The, the conclusion is that planes on, along all planes containing one of the geodesics, the curvature is minus one force pinched. And then by symmetry, since this group there is so transitive, it's true all over, in all directions. So, this is, so you see, what, what I call a complex hyperbolic plane. It's the metric, it's the ball in C2 equipped with what people sometimes call is Bergman metric, the natural metric invariant under uh, this whole biholomorphism group. It's a, it's a nice space. And now let's get back. All right. So that's an example. And this example is so symmetric that it's very hard to believe that you could kind of cheat and modify the metric in a bounded manner and improve pinching. But it's unknown. Right. But now I'll, I'd like to describe an approach to this problem via Heisenberg geometry. We've seen that Heisenberg group was hidden there. So now I explain this. It's the idea um, that the picture there of a ball uh, with a boundary sphere, uh, this familiar picture, uh, in fact, is general for negatively curved manifolds, more generally for hyperbolic metric spaces. So negatively curved manifolds, they come with a boundary sphere, a visual sphere, a sphere of directions, if you stand someplace in the manifold and you look, it's that sphere that you see, as if you were staring at the sky. And this, this sphere comes up, it comes with a distance, a visual distance, visual metric, which is obtained as follows. It's not the angle uh, at the origin. Uh, it's different. The distance between two visual directions, two points in, in, the, in the sky, it's done as follows. So you draw the light rays from these stars to your eyes, and you bring, you imagine that the stars, they come to you. And, and they stop when the distance uh, in, in space is equal to one. Uh, they come at certain distance r, and you define distance as e to the minus r. So if the points are visually very close, then they will get to distance once rather soon. The r is large, and so the e to the minus r is very small. This defines the usual topology of the sphere. That's the visual metric. 
And indeed, when curvature of space is uh, Oh, oh, wait. It's less than minus one. I, I was really confused in my notation. I apologize. The, that metric really satisfies, it's a metric, satisfies the triangle inequality. Now, uh, imagine that if that, that manifold uh, is close to hyperbolic space, then that metric on the sphere should be close to what you see in hyperbolic space. But in hyperbolic space, a visual metric is simply the usual round metric on the round sphere. And indeed, pinching of curvature controls the Holder exponent of the obvious map between these visual spheres, between the skies, the real hyperbolic sky, and the sky in this space of variable curvature. Right. And the inverse map, again, is one Lipschitz. So we're in a situation which is very much like uh, what we observed in, uh, with Heisenberg group. This uh, manifold of, boundary, of negative curvature come with a boundary, which is a metric space. And this metric space is related to an uh, ordinary the round sphere by a map which is holder in one direction. Lipschitz in the other, and the Holder exponent is related to curvature pinching. But now, it's not, if I want to compare such a, a manifold with pinched curvature to a, my beautiful example, complex hyperbolic plane, then there is a change of metric, changing the metric to an equivalent metric, as a disastrous effect on visual metrics. So the corresponding metrics at infinity are not equivalent at all, but something remains. They are quasi-symmetrically related. So what does quasi-symmetrically mean? It means that balls in one metric are pinched between concentric balls in the other metric in such a way that the ratio of radii of these concentric balls is bounded. This is what quasi-symmetric means. And that's all one can say. So, as you see, the relation between this pinch, the pinching problem and uh, what, what we see on the boundary, we see a holder Lipschitz uh, equivalence problem, except that we have this quasi-symmetric uh, twist in it. So the precise formulation is over there. So we have to consider such a situation. We are interested in a metric space X. Here it will be Heisenberg group. Right? And I wonder whether there exist holder continuous homeomorphisms from R3 to our space, not to our space, but to a space quasi-symmetric to our space, with Lipschitz inverse. So it's close to Gromov's problem, but there is this, this extra uh, quasi-symmetric complications. Right. And the connection between the pinching problem is given by Okay, it's given by the inequality there, uh, related this optimal pinching and this quasi-symmetric uh, version of Gromov's optimal exponent. Right. So now, um, this leads to, to this question. What is uh, this quasi-symmetric exponent for Heisenberg group? So conjecturally, it should be a half. And what I can prove is the two-thirds bound. So the same bound that Gromov obtained for the non-quasi-symmetric version of the problem. Right. 
So if there is a lot of time, which I doubt, I could describe the ideas there. I will probably don't. Right. So, uh, again, I'm over with, uh, with this list. That's enough problems, yeah? There are six different problems. But uh, the main subject of the talks will be explaining that theorem. I already explained the first line, but then I will successively explain the two last ones. And this will keep us busy for a while. Thank you for your attention. Thanks again, Pierre, um, and uh, we will see the, the, the following um, to tomorrow. Let me make one more remark. So dinner is at 7.30. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Right? So you have time to go down the Calanque, have a bath, and come back. Right? <laughs> yeah. So let me first apply a Heisenberg squeeze to the geography of this place to make it closer to, to here. Yeah. So you. Over. <laughs>